Hi everyone, this is Beth, and I'm so glad you're all here with me today. I have my coffee here in one of my favorite cups, and I have lipstick all over it. I don't know how to get past that. But anyway, I love this coffee. It's a flavored coffee. It's a chocolate raspberry, and I really like that. Although I like chocolate so much that the raspberry is almost a little too healthy for me in this. My computer is going off over there. Well, anyway, I am so excited to share with you what I'm going to be sharing with you today, and that is the first video that I'm doing in terms of my search to become really happy. And for those of you who have seen my channel recently, I've gotten really bare about who I am and what I have been about and my struggles that I've had in my life in my first half. I am in my second half now, and through one of the books, I realized you shouldn't necessarily say your age because age is just a number, and you guys, there are a lot of things to do with age that have to do with attitude. And I'm going to be doing videos in the future about the things we can do in terms of our attitude, which really affect not only how we feel, but also how healthy we are and how long we live, amazingly enough. I can hardly wait to share those with you. But age truly is just a number in a lot of ways. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you all of the things that I've learned so far about happiness. And I've learned them primarily in three different books. The first is Superhuman by Habit, A Guide to Becoming the Best Possible Version of Yourself One Tiny Habit at a Time. And for those of you who saw my habits video, this was huge in my habits video, and I will link it below because it is wonderful. And the more I read about how to be happy and actually the scientific research behind how to be happy, I realize that it is in a large part attitude, and it's something that we control. I think I used to think in my first half that, oh, you know, why am I a little bit mildly depressed a lot of the time? You know, why doesn't my life seem a little more happy, a little more exciting? And I didn't realize that I was responsible in large part for my feelings and that happiness was not just genetic. I mean, some of it is, but mostly it's not so much the things that happen to us in our lives. I mean, it is a little bit that, but more than that, it's our habit of how we react to those situations. And just like a lot of life I've realized lately is habits, and a lot of having a good life is forming good habits, a lot of having good happiness is forming good happiness habits. And in this video, I will be sharing with you five tips that I've learned so far, which have really helped me become markedly happier. Well, let's get back to the books. The second two books I'll be sharing with you, and I'm not going to specifically tell you which techniques came from which books, because quite honestly, I almost don't remember. And reading all of these three books really just helped me overall in my understanding of the scientific research behind how to become happier. But these are the other two books. The second one is The Happiness Advantage, How Positive Brain Fuels Success in Work and Life by Sean Aker. And this was a wonderful book, and it has lots and lots of scientific research. And one of the main things about this particular book is something that I found truly fascinating. And it is something that has really been in play in my whole life. Because for those of you who don't know, I guess a lot of people are goal-oriented people, and I certainly have been. And in my first half, I really set out the objectives and the goals and did a lot of the positive thinking stuff. And I would accomplish these things. And I always had the idea, well, when I have that bit of success or whatever, when I get there, then I'll be happy. And then I'd get there and I'd realize I really wasn't that happy. I was no more happier than I was when I started. And so then I think, well, maybe I just didn't have a big enough goal. I'll do this and then I'll be happy. Or I'll get new furniture and then I'll be happy. Or I'll get a different car and then I'll be happy. And you guys, happiness is truly an inside job. And that's what Sean Aker talks about a lot in his book, The Happiness Advantage. In fact, he says, in America, we have it wrong. And I think this is so true. We think in America, and we are taught to believe this, that success equals happiness. That once you achieve certain things, you will be happy. And you know, there are a lot of multimillionaire, very famous, very beautiful people who are miserable. And what his book tells us is that actually the scientific research shows that we have it backwards. That if you do those things to become happy, success will follow. And in fact, he mentioned a study that I'm sure you've all heard about. It's a Harvard study that started back in the Depression, and they looked at 268 Harvard sophomores, and they extensively questioned them. They filled out all these questionnaires at that point during the Depression and then all through their lives. 
they did Harvard sophomores and also just more underprivileged young adults from the Harvard area, and Harvard is in Boston, so these were Boston folks. And so they had two groups and they studied them over years. And initially they gave them all a survey and they asked, what is it that you want out of life? And they said, we want to be rich and we want to be famous. And you know, our society tells us that if you're rich and famous, then you just about got it all. You know, the explosion of the internet and Instagram and all of this stuff just says, oh, if I can just be rich and famous, I will be happy. Well, the interesting thing about this study, and it's the longest running attitudinal study in history, I think, because it is still going on. It involved all of those 268 Harvard men and those Boston men all through their lives, and now it's even into their spouses' lives and into their children's lives. It's gone on 75 years so far, but what they have found out is that at the end of life, all of these people, for the most part, what they said truly made them happy was relationships with others, was relationships with their family and their friends and being active in the communities. And that was what really brought them fulfillment. And many of the most rich and successful of those Harvard graduates and those other Bostonians, basically they were no more happy or they were even less happy than those who had maybe had less accomplishment or success in terms of what we all would think would be successful. But the truly happy people at the end of their lives were those who had the richest relationships with those around them. And I think in our second half, that's something that we truly need to remember. And I truly got diverted there because I do want to share with you the third book that I've really been finding very interesting. And all of these three books, I am listening to them on Audible, and it's a service that I have a link below too. And if you want to go through that link, I think they give you a 30-day free trial. It's regularly $14.95 and also a free Audible book. And what I've been finding out about listening to these Audible books is that I can listen to them over and over again, and I really do. I listen to them in a lot of free time type activities, when I'm working out, doing my weight training in the morning, when I'm driving to work, when I'm doing laundry or housework, something like that. And I'm really able to let a lot of these concepts sink in much more to me than just reading them on a page. And the third book is called The Positive Shift, Mastering Mindset to Improve Happiness, Health, and Longevity, and it's by Katherine A. Sanderson, PhD, and I especially like that book. It was chock full of scientific research, and in addition to just happiness and attitude, that book goes into our health and many, many studies that are about how our attitude and our attitudes about aging really impact our aging process, our memory, our health, even the age at which we die. The more and more I read her book, the more I realized that in our second half, we really have to be very positive about the aging process. We can't let society's stereotypes about aging get us down because not only does it kind of get us down emotionally, but it can actually have real world health consequences for us. We've just got to really guard our mind and our attitudes and be very positive to have the best aging process that we can. Okay, let me get into the tips that I've learned and they have really, really helped me. Tip number one is to practice gratitude, to practice gratitude. And the more I've read about this and learned about gratitude, the more I've realized that gratitude is kind of like a muscle and you have to build it up. You have to encourage it in yourself. You have to nurture your gratitude because just like pessimism is kind of a habit, gratitude is a habit. And one of the best gratitude hacks I got was out of that first book, The Superhuman Habit Book. And basically what he said is that it takes four to six weeks to start a happiness habit. And he says that since he has done that, he is now just automatically happy without ever thinking about it. And what he does is that anytime he has something negative happen to him, for instance, maybe he gets a flat tire, he immediately tries to shift his thoughts instead of saying, oh, I've got that flat tire, how awful. He tries to immediately go, well, I have a flat tire, but look at the bright side. I'm going to use my frequent flyer charge card to do the tow and I'll get frequent flyer miles. Or, and this is terrible, but if my pet dies, well, at least I won't have to feed it again. And I know that sounds awful. He says, sometimes these things are humorous, but you just need to do that. And he says the positive that comes out of the negative doesn't even have to equal the negative thing that happened. It just has to be there and you don't have to mull it over or figure it out. You just have to state the positive outcome and then go on. 
And another one he mentioned is, if you lose a girlfriend, say, well, that just paves the way for the new, better girlfriend to come in. And you know, I was kind of forcing myself to do this for a while, and I still am, but I am really noticing the difference. For instance, one morning I was about to head out to work, and I realized that my husband had left his jacket on the chair. And I don't like that because I like to reset a room when I leave the room, which is kind of pick things up and make it look like it did when I entered the room. And I like it when he does that too. So my first inclination was to go, oh, look what my husband did. But because of this kind of gratitude habit training I'm doing, my first thought was, oh, he left his jacket on the chair. And then I said, oh, but thank God I have a husband to complain about. And it just really was kind of an automatic shift to something positive. And then the same thing happened a few days later when our security alarm went off because I forgot it was on and I opened the back door on my way to work and it blared at me. And my first thought was, ah, the security alarm went off. And then I thought, well, at least it works now because for the past six or nine months it hasn't worked. And I've been hoping that Alan would call the security people and get it fixed. And he did that finally, which was wonderful. I guess I could have called too, but somehow I thought that would be his job. But anyway, that is how this gratitude switching habit works. See something negative that happens and immediately switch it to a positive thought. And the author did say at first it feels a little bit cumbersome and you think, well, this is kind of silly, but it does work over time. And I'm certainly noticing that over time that my tendency to go a bit negative is switching to a tendency to immediately switch it to a positive. And another study that the Happiness Advantage book detailed, and there were many, too numerous to mention, but one of them I found particularly interesting, it involved nuns at Notre Dame Cathedral in 1917. And as part of their nun training, I guess, in the nunnery, they had to keep these daily journals of what was going on in their life. But anyway, the researchers decided that it would be interesting to analyze all of these journals because most all of these nuns were dead. But they analyzed these journals and they would score each journal on positivity. And say one person's journal would say, well, I got up this morning and I went to Vespers and did my prayers. And then I went to school and I taught my school classes, just no affect at all. While the journals of other nuns might be more positive, like I got up this morning and looked out the window and it was an absolutely gorgeous day and the birds were singing. And then I went to prayers and I just gave glory to God. What a wonderful morning I had and an entry like that would be scored much more positive. Well, what the researchers found after analyzing all the data from all of these journals was that over the course of their lives, the more optimistic nuns actually lived longer than the more pessimistic or neutral nuns. The researchers found that 90% of those happiest nuns at around age 29, they were still alive at age 90, 90% versus only 23% still alive of the less optimistic, less positive nuns. So what that shows you is that being positive, being optimistic, being grateful actually has great health benefits for our lives. And one thing that I particularly liked about Sean Aker's book, The Happiness Advantage, is that after showing you all of these research studies about happiness and the various things which led to happiness, he created an attitude spreadsheet that you're supposed to do every morning for 30 days. And he says you'll have a very positive result after doing it for 30 days. And the spreadsheet basically prompts you each day to think about the things you're grateful for and to write them down. And I'll show you some of my entries in that spreadsheet. And the thing that's so funny about this is you always hear books that say, oh, write 10 things you're grateful for every week or write something you're grateful for every evening. And I always thought, well, that's kind of mamby pamby, you know, you know, that's nice and everything, but I could not really see that it was supported by any research at all that I knew of. But the reality is it is supported by a tremendous amount of research. And the reason writing down things we're grateful for each day really helps is that basically you are training your mind to look for things that make you happy, to look for the advantages in your life, to look for the things that make you grateful in your life. And then your mind becomes more trained to look for those things and you gradually start to see them all around you and you become a more and more grateful person. And I've certainly found that that has really worked out for me over about the last six weeks I've been doing this study. So in a moment, I'm going to show you my spreadsheet and below the video, I also have a link to, a, to an empty spreadsheet that you can download and put on your desktop. And if you would like to start doing this gratitude checklist each day, I think it's a wonderful thing. And I fill out this spreadsheet every morning as part of my morning habits. 
In the first column, you can see the date there. In anticipation one today, you do three things that you're looking forward to that you're anticipating as a good thing in your day. Today was March 6, getting off at noon today because it's a Friday. I always love that. And it says why I love my Friday afternoons. And the second anticipation I was looking forward to today was that I was making this happy video for you all and why I, I really do love helping women. And so it's a way I can do that. And the third thing I was looking forward to today was washing my hair. That's pretty simple. I just like to have freshly washed hair to start the weekend. Now, the next part of the spreadsheet involves things that we're specifically thankful for. And the first thing I was thankful for is reading more about how to create a good life. And the why is I like to learn so I can also help others. And the second thing I'm thankful for is that I've completed five weeks of my weight training and I'm really, really enjoying that. And the reason why is I'm making progress in my weight training. And the third thing I'm thankful for is having a Friday night date with Alan. And the reason is we get to have fun together tonight and Friday nights are wonderful, I have to admit. And the next question on the spreadsheet, you write about something that happened within the last 24 hours that you're grateful for. And I said, we talked with Colin and got to catch up on his life. We're starting to establish our weekly pattern of talking with each other on the phone and being an ongoing part of each other's lives. And I really am so happy about that. I have one son who lives away and he started his own business and then he sold his business and now he's working for that company in another state. And he and his wife are unbelievably, incredibly busy. And for the longest time, you know, we definitely texted every now and then and we were always together on holidays. But in terms of like weekly conversation, he was just really busy. So I'm really, really happy that we've started this process of talking to each other each week on the phone and catching up. It just makes me feel so good. Okay, that was my gratitude in the last 24 hours. And then you have to do 15 minutes of movement in the day. That's really important. And I get that through my weight training. And you also have to smile three times a day. And I'll be discussing the importance of smiling in just a few minutes. And then you have to do one nice thing for someone else today. And that can be simply opening the door for someone, smiling at them, helping them carry some packages in, something like that. Sharing a piece of gum, that's, that's one that I do. I give people gum or candy sometimes if I don't want to eat it myself. But doing something nice for someone else. And the last thing on the spreadsheet is that we need to reach out to someone each day. And he says it doesn't matter if it's an email or a text or a personal contact. And of course, he does prefer that you make a personal phone call or a personal contact. But reaching out to others, especially as we get to be older, is so, so important to us. Okay, the second tip for happiness is to smile. And you know, that seems kind of self-evident, but there's actually scientific research which backs up how good smiling is for us. Because when we smile, it just activates the endorphins and the serotonin in our brain. It does make us happier to smile. And I know that's why in the happiness advantage, there's a column, did you smile three times today? But we kind of have to remind ourselves to that. And you know, sometimes when you're feeling down, even if you have to force the smile, you know, it just makes you feel better to smile. So smiling is very, very important. And you know, in one of the books, and I can't remember which one right now, they did kind of a smiling study on this whole big group of baseball players. And I think it was from like 1947, somewhere back then. And it was a huge amount of baseball players. Maybe it was the whole league, something like that. And they looked at these pictures and they made note of the players who weren't smiling at all, who were just stoic. And then the players who were kind of half smiling, and then the third group was the players that really just cracked open a big grin and really, really smiled. And then they recorded the date at which each of these players died. And amazingly enough, there was a huge difference in lifespan between those players with the big grins versus those players who didn't smile. And in each of the three groups, it just went up just like a stair step. The ones who didn't smile at all lived shorter lives. The middle players with the kind of middle smile they lived just a little longer than the first group. And the big grin players lived like nine years longer than the first group. It was truly amazing. So smiling not only makes us happy, it makes us feel good, but it obviously has great health benefits as well. Now, the third thing that all of the three happiness books mentioned is meditation. And there is a lot of scientific research that backs that meditation is very, very good for us and really increases our level of happiness. For instance, they've always known that monks who meditate on a daily basis have a very enlarged prefrontal cortex. And one of the things the prefrontal cortex does, I can't say it, 
is it increases the level of contentment and happiness we have in our lives, the larger it is. And researchers knew this was true for monks who practice meditation for years, but they wanted to do a study on how long it took for just novice meditators who are just getting into meditation to have growth in their prefrontal cortex. And amazingly, they found that it only takes about two months for those differences in the brain to show and for the prefrontal cortex to expand which indicates more happiness and contentment coming into one's life. And that's what all of these books said. They said even if you just start with five minutes of meditation a day, after two months of meditation, you should really start feeling calmer and more in control and happier. And I started with just five minutes a day and now I've worked up to 10 minutes a day and I'm really enjoying it so far. And one thing I've noticed about it, and I've probably done it about four to five weeks now, is that first, sometimes I get these tingles, which just feel absolutely wonderful. And I feel like spiritually, that's like God is a little more in my life or that I'm more spiritually attuned. But another thing that I've noticed that's more practical is that where if somebody used to make me mad, I could just get really inflamed all of a sudden and just say something I would regret. Well, since I started meditating, I'm kind of noticing that I can kind of stop and consider what I'm going to do before I do it. I'm not quite so reactive and I'm really liking that. And the fourth tip I have is to get good sleep. And for those of you who followed my channel for a while know, I have really struggled with getting good sleep. I tend to wake up really early in the morning, 2.30, 3 o'clock, and sometimes I just can't get back to sleep. Well, what I've been doing is a series of things that really have been helping in terms of keeping me asleep all night long. The first thing I'm doing is that I'm going into bed earlier. Instead of waiting till 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, since I try to get up at five o'clock every morning to do my weight workouts and other things that I do in the morning, I try to get into bed at nine o'clock. And then I know I won't go to sleep till about 10, but I start to wind down. I try not to watch anything like YouTube videos or TV or anything like that. I try to just read before I go to bed because I find that that kind of puts me to sleep. Then another thing that's important is to cut off all the electronic devices in your room that you can and to have your room as dark as possible and if you can't do that, then you can use a sleep mask. And I just do that because we have tons of little blue lights all over our bedroom. My husband loves technology and we have all kinds of things in our bedroom. But I use a black satin sleep mask and it really does keep me asleep. It is wonderful. And I don't really have too much of a problem with noise at night waking me up. But if you do, earplugs are a really good option. And another thing that has really helped me is taking melatonin each night. And for a while, I was just taking a five milligram melatonin and it worked pretty well. But recently I found a better formulation of melatonin for me. It's three grams of melatonin with magnesium. And something about magnesium when it's mixed with melatonin is known to help you sleep better and to sleep longer through the night. And that is really what I've been noticing. And I'll try to put a link below for that magnesium plus melatonin preparation because I think it's really been effective. Now, my fifth happiness tip is to reduce social media if possible. And you know, here I am on social media, but basically the studies are showing that the more time you spend on Facebook, really the more miserable you become. And I am not at all surprised by that. I used to do a lot of Facebook for a while and I ended up getting off of it entirely, which I feel a little guilty about, but not so much because number one, I found that I was comparing my life with the lives of others. And of course, everybody posts these very happy pictures of their fabulous vacations, their perfect kids, you know, whatever. And it just kind of made me feel a little less than. And that's exactly what the scientific research of these types of things is showing is that the longer we're on social media each day, the less positive we feel about our lives. And I certainly noticed that was the case with YouTube, and it's the reason that I hardly watch any other YouTube videos now in terms of the beauty-related videos, because I used to watch them all the time, and I would invariably compare my channel to others and think, oh, they have more views than I do, or they're getting more subscribers, and I would just feel kind of lousy. And that was kind of silly. And so I realized if I just stopped doing that, that I could just be happy with my own channel, just compare myself with maybe my last video and just, you know, do my thing and not compare myself with others. And that was really, really helpful. And the sixth tip is to act as if. Act as if you're happy. And that is a fabulous tip. And I found that it really, really works well. And how this works is if you're feeling kind of down or blue, you think, hey, 
what would a happy person be doing right now? And so all of a sudden, you know, your posture improves, you get a smile on your face, you're like, oh gosh, you know, I'm scrubbing this floor, but I'm happy. I'm drinking this coffee and it is fabulous, which it is. It's getting a little cold, but you know, it's not too cold, which is really, really good. I did that little gratitude shift there. It's not burning me. I guess that's the advantage to cold coffee. But basically, as we go through our days, if we're feeling a little blue for any reason, just change the focus by acting as if we are happy, smiling and doing what a happy person does. And friends, if you like this video, I hope you'll give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend or subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate that. Okay, thank you for being with me on my happiness hacks video. I really have been loving what I've been learning. Okay, let's go ahead and choose a card. And this is from the Gabriel Bernstein card deck called Miracles Now. Okay, it says, when I shine bright, I give others permission to shine with me. When I shine bright, I give others permission to shine with me. Friends, I absolutely love this card. And it's something that in my first half, I didn't do very well. That is the feeling. And I know you've had this too. Sometimes you think, you know, I'm a pretty cool person. I have a lot going on in my life. I feel really great about things. And you almost feel like that would make people feel less than if you really told them how great things were going. And after enough time of downplaying your life, pretty soon you don't feel very good about your own life either. So friends, just for today, let's remember that when we shine bright and we admit how great and fabulous and wonderful our life is, that gives others the permission to shine bright as well. Take care and I'll see you in my next video.